You're listening to the Patient Advocacy Now podcast, presented by Greater National Advocates. It's just gut-wrenching sometimes. Like, if it's sad and they're crying, I might cry. (laughs) Amazing how many doctors do not even want to treat somebody who has Medicaid. Medical system is about making money. And I said, so are you hiring more nurses or you're just telling each nurse to work harder? Claudia, thank you so much for being with us. How are you today? Fantastic and thrilled and honored to be here with you. Well, we are honored to have you. I think your story is so indicative of so many advocates in the field where you have a friend or a family, usually a family member who falls ill and you have to kind of step up and be the advocate. Um, and, and then you realize there are other people who need this service. What made you decide to kind of, you know, cause a lot of people do go and help their family, but it never occurs to them to kind of continue that work. Why did you decide to kind of do that yourself? Yeah, you know, all of what you just said. I, when I chose pharmacy as a career prior to advocacy, it was very analytical and methodical. Like, you know, what I, I'm good at chemistry and it's very checkboxy. And I need something that will help allow me to help people while also having a flexible career. And so I checked all the boxes. This switch to patient advocacy was very much the opposite. It was very much just an inner knowing that I have to do what I did for my dad for other people. At that time, I didn't even have the verbiage of patient advocate. Um, I knew what the work was that we did, but I didn't know that this was a field and that others were doing it. I just knew that it was a gap that needed to be filled and there wasn't even a decision. It wasn't analytical. It wasn't even in my head. It was just like, I have to do this and I'm going to just figure it out. So as I was helping my dad and really in the weeds of his medical care and you know, real time looking at his labs and making decisions and talking to the medical team, I'm looking around the ICU bay and the other patients who are around him thinking, what, what are these people doing? Who's helping them? You know, there's nobody in their room. Uh, Is it just, they just receive the care that they receive and nobody knows what's happening on the back end, because I can tell you there's a lot of errors that happen on the back end and not out of malintention out of the team, but the reality is it's, it's, everybody's overburdened and overworked and humans make errors. So I just was shocked at what was happening and how little oversight there was. And so it was very much a, a just a intuitive, deeper knowing, very different from my choice to go into pharmacy. What were some of the challenges that you faced that were a bit surprising to you when you were taking care of your own father? You know, um, I think I expected a higher level of attentiveness and compassion. I, I think being on the other side of the healthcare system as a healthcare professional, we see through a different lens. We think we're providing the best care. We think that the patients are experiencing our care in a certain way. And we don't really understand that that's not happening until we are on the other side. And so I was just really shocked by how much was missed, how many errors were happening. I mean, they would document, they documented his weight as 300 pounds when he was like 175 on a good day. How does and, that happen? And these things just happen all the time. And, you know, in some cases that may not be a huge deal depending on what's happening, but you know, there's a lot of medications, including chemotherapy that are very weight based. And so that type of an error could be life-threatening and often is. And so just, you know, seemingly little things that may feel insignificant to others, but Mm -hmm. can, can down the, you know, downstream have huge sequela and complications. So, you know, um, every step of the way I saw something that was very saddening to me and frustrating, you know, just with the interactions with, how my dad was treated by physicians, by nurses. And again, I actually, my husband's a physician, so I don't have any ill will to it. I actually know that they're amazing people. And so I really think there's this disconnect between what we think we're doing for patients and what they're receiving. And, and so if there's a gray area in there and that's where I feel like I, I, my zone of genius is now is in that gray area in that middle zone. And what did, when you say I was, you know, that you were shocked by the way your father was being treated. Can you go into some detail? Was it was it that he was being dismissed or just kind of not attended to at all? 
Yeah. I'll give you some specifics. So um, a lot of times it was a dismissive feeling, but for instance, when he went in to see a pulmonologist, um, the fellow who is basically an upper level resident came in first and did his evaluation and um, documented that he had done a chest exam, which he's a pulmonologist. It would make sense to do a chest exam. He did not do a chest exam, um, but he documented that he did. And this type of thing, and people are like, how does this happen? It logistically on the back end of things, there are templates that physicians use, a lot of healthcare professionals use from an electronic medical record system. And those templates auto populate. And then the, you're supposed to go in and change things. Well, the auto population of those, while it might feel time efficient, also lends itself to errors. So things can get documented that didn't actually happen. And so it's not to say that the fellow went in and said, yes, I did the chest exam and typed that in, but it was likely an auto population of what was assumed to have been done in a pulmonologist's office. Um, well, it wasn't done. So the attending physician came in thinking everything was done, also didn't do, and I wasn't at this appointment, also didn't do a chest exam. And two days later, he had a chest tube because he his chest was filled with fluid and he, he, and that would have so been how did you possible. find how, so here's a here's a really important question how did you find this out so that it wasn't done when he when it progressed to the point of chest tube i then went through the records of because i was like how could this have gotten missed so i went through the pulmonologist records saw that it said the fellow documented or auto populated and didn't fix that the lungs were clear to auscultation, meaning like they're, it, the lungs were clear. There's no possible way they were clear two days before the chest tube was placed. Um, and I actually contacted the attending pulmonologist about it. And I said, Hey, I know there's nothing that can be done now. It's already done, but you need to know to, you need to know as an attending that you can't always trust what the fellow did. And your job as an attending is to come in and make sure you're the quality control. I mean, that's the reality. You can't assume everything was done as it was documented. And um, he had nothing to say to me. He knew I was right. So. Wow. Yeah. So things like that. I mean, lots of, lots of examples like that, but um, you know, it's, it's really, most people wouldn't even know. Most people wouldn't know that that even happened on the back end. They would think, oh, I must have just progressed in two sure. days. You know, yeah, like I, would, I just got I would worse. have no idea that that wasn't possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so as an advocate, now that you're fulfilling that role for other people, what would you do to step in and kind of try and mitigate those issues? Yeah, so my clients really dictate the um, and request the level of involvement they want. So I do have a lot of clients who have me either physically if they're in my area or on speakerphone at their appointments. And so, and I was in for the most part at most of my father's appointments. I just happened to miss that one. But so I am physically able to ask the questions, make sure there's no gaps in what's being, what's happening. Um, we usually also will talk before and after the appointment. So I'm very clear on sort of what's been going on and what questions we should be asking. Afterwards, we're debriefing. Is there anything we need to follow up on? Are we clear on next steps? I usually send a summary of what I have heard during that appointment. So that way my clients can also confirm that that's what they heard. And if it's not, then we'll talk about what seems to be different. Like I didn't hear that. That seems different. Um, so let's talk about it because there's a lot that happens in a 10 to 15 minute appointment and a lot of things are said and a lot of instructions are given. And that after visit summary that you get is full of fluff and mostly useless information. And yeah. so, um, so nobody looks at it, you know? And so, um, so th this is just a streamlined way of making sure the appointment is is conducted efficiently and productively for the client and that everybody understands where we're headed afterwards. And so is that do you find that that's your it's kind of navigating the whole medical process? Is that your main role as an advocate that you get hired for? Yeah, you know, um, I gave a presentation yesterday and I was I was thinking on the way home from it. I think the medical system and people in general are like, okay, well, what bucket do you all fall in? What is this patient advocacy? You know, like, are you a case manager? Because we have these concepts already filled for us of this bucket is this, the social worker, the case manager. So like, where do you guys fit? And, and the visual that came to me as I was thinking through this on the way home is if you think of a bunch of buckets, 
and they're round, there are spaces in between. If we were to line them up, there are spaces in between each of those because they're not, you know, they're not 90 degree angles. And I see my role and every patient advocate does a little bit of a different, has a little bit of a different approach, but I really feel my role is in those those spaces in between the buckets. It's everything that isn't currently being done. And so it doesn't fall within a current bucket. And I actually think that's what we need in healthcare is what what are the gaps and who's going to fill those? And it really has to be filled from outside the system because there isn't a job description that um, says, get on a speakerphone call with this person. Like there isn't a job description that fits that. So there's not a bucket that fits that role and title. And so it's all of the the things that fall through the cracks. It's the it's the patient who at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night after he got discharged from the hospital has a question about one of his discharge medications and the doses and who is he going to call? There is nobody to call. The primary care doctor doesn't even know he was in the hospital or doesn't know the discharge information. Yeah, you can't call and the primary is not going to call answer you at 10 p.m. anyways, unless you have a concierge doctor, but most primary care doctors aren't answering at 10 p.m. And they don't know what happened anyways. You're not called, well, who are you going to call at the hospital? There, there's no, like, there's no 800 number for the person yeah. who's going to answer this. There's, it doesn't exist. So it's those holes that, that I'm filling. And what I find so fascinating is that every patient advocate has their own unique background and unique way of coming into the profession. So knowing some of your background, but not so much of it, what, what do you feel makes you unique as a patient advocate? Yeah. I, I love this field because it's, I, I kind of feel like it's um, anarchy at its best um, in, in the most ethical, amazing way that everybody's coming in. Like, I want to give all of myself in, in every way I know I can without the limitations of a job description, employment contract, et cetera. And so what I feel like I bring to the table is you know, over a decade and a half of clinical pharmacy work, meaning from a knowledge standpoint, I have a pretty deep understanding of medications, where they fit, where they maybe don't fit, what questions we need to ask. But also after my dad passed away, I dove into a pretty deep spiritual journey. I started asking questions that um, I didn't, I was not really the curious kid who asked questions. Like you tell me something and I'm like, Full, like full force, mostly believing it. So, um, you know, I studied exactly like I was told to study and I just didn't, I wasn't a super curious kid. I was just, I followed the rules like to the T. And I started asking a lot of questions after my dad died, just like nothing makes, all of a sudden nothing made any sense. And I really had to unlearn a lot that wasn't serving me. And in that spiritual journey, I, I found ways to help my clients that I would have never been able to do as a traditional pharmacist. I would have never been able to tap into that. So, you know, I mean, I create if the, if my patients wanted and not everybody is on that same path, but um, you know, I've created specific tailored guided meditations for my patients, um, you know, just, and, you know, pray with them, like depending on where they're at and what they're needing, there's gaps that I can fill because of where I've been. And, and, and that spiritual journey. So I, um, I really love pulling all of those pieces together and really just being able to sit and actively listen and, and provide people with peace. There's not always a solid answer and I don't always have a solid answer, but I do believe that most of the time my clients have access to a deeper wisdom that can provide some guidance. And so sometimes it's leading them to that. And if they tell me, Hey, I, which has happened. Hey, I, um, you know, I've intuitively feel like, like I need to go to India to have this Ayurvedic treatment. Most of the Western medical system in this particular patient's case would say, that's crazy. You're not well enough to do that. You're not going there. This, you know, like this doesn't even make any sense. There's no, there's no um, peer reviewed randomized clinical trial that says you should have the Ayurvedic treatment. You know, there'd be all the, all the very Western medicine type answers. My answer was, if you feel like this needs to happen, let's do everything we need to do to make you get there safely. And so I've got her, you know, uh, an assistant that's going, who is, has a healthcare background. I've talked to the medical team over there, like, let's do this. Uh, If that's what you feel like you need to do, that's not my call. That's for me to help guide you through that. So, yeah. It's almost a therapeutic role, like a spiritual therapeutic role where combined with this kind of ombudsman of, of, of medical, you know, 
kind yeah. of concierge yeah. service. It's so interesting. What do you feel? I mean, you mentioned the kind of the Western view that notwithstanding, do you feel like there are things broken in the medical system that you would wish uh, would change? Endless things. <laughs> um, there's endless. I'm actually currently in the uh, book editing process of the book of all of this. And what's the book called? Um, I, I'm, they're not allowing me to share the title yet, but okay. it, no the, the subtitle is think like a doctor, find peace as a patient. Um, and so to honor my publisher, we're, we're still in like the lead editing part, but the point of it is, is, is to explain how the system works from like medical training through medical culture through, and you know, my husband's a physician. We've been together since high school. So I have been through the entire, like I have seen all of it. I've seen the medical school process. I've seen the residency process. I see him now. Um, I'm very uh, intimately aware of where the gaps start and where the culture begins and why it continues. And so I, in the book, discuss the context behind what some of the frustrations are, because I think giving some context helps people understand, not to say that now we're, we're okay with it and, you know, we would just be passive, you know, recipients of poor care. But if you have some context, um, it provides a little bit more of an understanding and informs your ability to navigate it. So, the, you know, it really starts from the medical training and culture where the brokenness begins. And so I, I outline that in the book, but basically, you know, physicians aren't trained about nutrition. They aren't trained about life. That's shifting, but it's such a slow process. It's shifting. There are some medical schools now that do, but as a whole, what medical students are being trained on is, you know, your basic pathophysiology, you know, your biochemistry, you know, the basic things that you need to know about disease and then how to treat them all. So, which basically means medications, <laughs> like what medications treat this and, and, and that's the, the training. And then they go to their residency, but they're, you know, nobody's talking about lifestyle factors that are relating to health. Nobody's talking about how to, you know, change uh, somebody's nutritional consumption based on what their needs are on, in their disease because they don't know it. And so the frustration on the patient side is, well, all I'm being given is is option is medication options. That's all I'm being given, and then this medication is causing a side effect, and now I'm getting another medication. And so I usually coach my clients through understanding where the Western medical system does have a zone of genius. You know, yeah. surgery. Like if if I need surgery, there's not really anywhere else I'm going to be able to go. I can't really go to right. a chiropractor for surgery. So um, there's some some areas where Western medicine does an amazing life saving job, and there's some areas where there's just an a obvious and blatant weakness. And if we can understand that, rather than banging our head on a door that isn't going to open for us, let's use the system for what it's great at. And then if we feel like we need to seek assistance elsewhere, we'll go elsewhere. But I don't really know that that answered your question. There's a lot of brokenness in the system and, and the physicians and the staff are completely overburdened and not supported. So you're, you have, you have people treating you who haven't slept in days, you know, for more than two hours at a time yeah. who, you know, can barely go. I mean, you know, surgeons barely go to the bathroom. They they're in 12 hour surgeries, you know, sometimes they have to catheterize themselves. I mean, there's no time for the bathroom. There's no time for drinking water or eating. You're, you're dealing with staff who are just depleted. So their ability to give to you from a f over full filling cup is, is non-existent. And so there's just a need to understand all of these pieces. And um, yeah, so that might've been more than what you wanted. <laughs> No, I think that speaks to the volume of things that need a bit of a shift. And, you know, the the common consensus that I've gathered is that there's a lot. There's a lot that needs to be revisited and rethought. Um, most of what I've heard from you just in that little blip was kind of the physician and the educational institutions approach. Let me phrase uh, kind of a, a follow up question here is if you could give a patient, someone listening, one piece of advice on what they could do to kind of better their chances at having successful health care, what would it be? To give yourself permission. Give yourself permission to do what you know is right. That might mean give yourself permission to change doctors. That might mean give yourself permission to tap into your intuition and listen 
to what your body's telling you. I think a lot of symptoms, most all symptoms are messages to us rather than little bits of segmented pieces that we need a physician to tell us what's going on. We're ultimately experts, experts in a way that a physician can never be um, and a deeper knowing. So I feel like there's this, this knowing from a knowledge standpoint, and then there's a knowing from just a deeper wisdom and, no, and nobody can have that knowing for you, the second knowing. And so permission to tap into that and listen to it. Good advice. I, you are the expert on your body, essentially. Mm-hmm. That's essentially what, what I'm getting. And and it's true. Nobody can tell you what pain feels like for you. That's why we have this arbitrary on a scale of one to 10. Where are you? on And it's like, well, my 10 is different than your 10. Right, right. Um, so interesting. Tell me about um, your company, the Peace Advocacy Group, and kind of what what it is that you do. I know you have your own podcast and you have a, a course as well on patient advocacy. Talk to me about those uh, efforts and, and what the goals are. Yeah. So my podcast is Minding Wellness. And so I, I talk all topics, mind, body, spirit with um, a variety of guests. And um, so my company, Peace Advocacy Group, started, I I was the group, (laughs) I was the solo group for many years. And I I now have, I I moved from my original location where I started my company in Gainesville, Florida, and I moved to the Tampa Bay area. And I now have an RN who um, is sort of my boots on the ground in Gainesville, since that area um, still has a pretty strong word of mouth for the services that I provide. And so we sort of in tandem take care of our clients um, in our local areas. And then I also absolutely handle all kinds of client needs throughout the country virtually. So that includes, um, I'm a radical remission coach as well, which is, um, you know, a body of research by Dr. Kelly Turner with, with sort of a, um, spiritual intuitive look at, at how people end up going into remission from cancer that, is very outside of what Western medicine expected. It's um, called and, radical remission. Radical so this is remission. new for me. That's why I so radical yes. remission. Okay. Um, absolutely yes. recommend to you and your guests to look into it. Um, you can go to the website, read tons of stories. There's a docu series, two books, radical remission, radical hope. Um, looking at basically, she looked at over 1500 cases of people who were sent home to basically die that live the rest of their years because they were end stage cancer and they're still living. So she was like, this is what I want to do my research on. Why are they still living? And why aren't we hearing about these cases? And what did they do that we don't know to do in the traditional conventional medical system? And so, so that's, that's that body of research. So I'm a coach on that. And, um, you know, interestingly, I have a, I have a new client with radical remission and he said something last week that was so powerful. And he said, Western medicine doesn't feel like a resting place. It doesn't feel like home. And like, it makes me want to cry just saying that because that's where I feel like um, peace advocacy groups help group helps is giving people a home to come to, you know, when they come to me and tell me, Hey, you know, I think I'm having this weird reaction to this medicine. None of the doctors believe it because it's not a a reaction that anybody else has. Mm -hmm. I'm that Mm -hmm. person who's willing to listen and say, I absolutely believe you. Let's talk through it. And, and so I feel like home is um, such a great, and I really didn't sort of put that together until he said that. And I I feel like home is such a great um, visual and we all feel like what an idealistic home would be, which is, you know, someplace you can go that's non-judgmental, where there's a champion. If something were to occur, you know, a kid's bullied or like somebody's a champion in the home who's going to step up and take care of that. And then there's times when you might just sit on the couch and be an active listener with, with the person. And so I feel like that's, that definitely encompasses kind of what, what our feel is. So, um, and then I do host a course for, um, I have a, I have a free course for patients that, um, just to, overview of how to um, organize your medical records and get them sort of ready to, to go if you need them. And then I also host a course for others to become a patient advocate if they're interested in it and really diving into the mindset shift first before we get into the into the meat of the program, because it really is a mindset shift to go from a traditional, you know, clock in, clock out. Mm-hmm. I work within the confines of my job description to now, um, I do. I literally do. I mean, I've, I've been asked to pick up Worcestershire sauce on the way on the way to a patient's house. And I'm going to if that's what my patient needs, I'm going to do it, you know. And so it, it's a mindset shift. So, yeah, that's so interesting that the mindset that the Worcestershire, I don't know, I can never say the word, but the that, that story <laughs> is a, a great example of like what is at the heart of advocacy is like you're 
you're essentially, you become family in many ways. And so it's like, I don't know, what do you, what do you need is the question. Right. I think that the bigger question for most advocates is where's the line that you can't cross, not mm -hmm. the job description um, and learning those, you know, few legalities that you have to obviously is really important. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what you're saying, especially with being your own advocate and dictating your own thing, it's so interesting in the DSM-5, there's a, I think there's a, a new diagnosis of medical non-compliance. So it's like if you have this, if you have this approach as a patient that you disagree, they can actually stick you with a label now that you have a, a mental disorder, mm -hmm. you know, of sorts. And so it's, it kind of speaks to the Western approach and how maybe it, it's not always spot on um, with what the patient needs. And I, and, and, and I feel it in a very deep way. Um, to get to the course and the podcast that you're talking about it is the best place to go to your website, peaceadvocacygroup.com. Yep. Everything's housed there. So that's the easiest place. Um, my podcast is also on whatever podcast platforms anybody who's listening listens to. So, um, you know, if you wanted to pull it up on Apple, that's fine too, but all of it is housed on the website. So that's the easiest. Well, Claudia, thank you so much for being with us and sharing your your journey and your wisdom. Um, it was definitely insightful for me. I'm going to look into radical remission myself because always fun to look up new approaches. Um, yeah. And and I wish you the best of luck. And maybe we'll have you back on the show and kind of get an update at some point. Fantastic. Thank you so much.